All right, so we're continuing this with 1.03 here, and I want to talk about Darwin. So Darwin, uh, a lot of people would probably think that Darwin, you know, he's the guy who introduced evolution, and a lot of people typically put evolution up against religion and things like that, but Darwin was actually pretty religious. In fact, he had a lot of trouble as he was writing this book. I think it took him a few years to write the books, really come up with his ideas before he even published it, because it kind of went against his beliefs to a great extent, and he had a lot of trouble with this because he knew this was going to be a big problem for people at the time. Uh, you know, so it wasn't like he was going against God. He was actually a very religious man himself. Uh, very interesting guy as he worked with this, you know, as he worked with this material. So when he wrote on the origin of species, um, create, considered one of the greatest books of science out there, he talks at length about pigeons. And the reason why he kind of talked about pigeons so much, which I guess to us Americans especially seems really weird, is because he was trying to prepare his reader for what was going to come up. He knew his readers would feel at home with the discussion of pigeon breeding, which was a very popular pastime in Victorian days. So people understood pigeon breeding. This was something that they did as a hobby. You, know, you, you may hear about people who do this with chickens nowadays, but people do this with pigeons as well. Uh, he talks at length about pigeons, which were bred and kept in Victorian England, and he was fascinated. He actually kept pigeons himself, and he was fascinated with the morphological and behavioral qualities of the pigeons to, as well. So just to kind of give you an idea of this, these are three different pigeons and these are all bred in different ways. We often think of the pigeon with like the iridescent neck and so forth. You know, we think about like in New York, you know, you know, on the streets, things like that. But these pigeons can be um, bred in such a way to have very elaborate feathers and to have some special behavioral effects as well. There are tumbler pigeons that seem to kind of somersault over themselves when they fly as you can see in this picture here. And then of course, homing pigeons, most of you have probably heard of homing pigeons before. These are pigeons that you can release far from home and they still find their way back home. You know, it goes back to the carrier pigeon, which is now extinct, I do, as a, if memory serves correctly, um, unfortunately. But these, you know, these pigeons were able to um, have immense variations in their behavior in addition to their morphological features. And all of this is due to artificial selection. Artificial selection is where humans decide this is the traits that we want to be there and we do this. This process leads to new varieties, it leads to new species. This also occurs in nature, but it's very interesting to study artificial selection because in artificial selection, we can directly see our relation to it. And it's the same thing that natural selection is. It's just natural selection. It's nature doing the trending, not humans. In the last unit, I mentioned about dogs, and we'll get back to that in just a second. But anyway, so there, it was very important that Darwin focused a lot on artificial selection, especially from pigeons, because people understood the concept of the pigeon in this case. And natural selection is where traits conferring the highest reproductive success to their bearers increase in frequency over time. If being a big a, um, entity um, organism is helpful, then your children are going to be big and they're going to produce big children and that's going to be on and on. If it's more um, advantageous for your kind to be smaller, then the smaller ones are going to be more likely to reproduce and that trait is going to increase in the population over time as well. Um, artificial selection, again, as we just said, let's, let's talk about this a little bit more in detail. Um, for more than 100,000 years, humans have worked with the wolf and developed it into humans. We have shaped the way um, animals look, especially wolf, wolves with dogs. We do this with plants as well. We do this all the time. If you've ever seen like a picture of corn, what a piece of corn looked like when it was originally found, what was it like 1500, 1500s, 1600s, to what it looks like today, they look nothing alike. Um, we do this with, with plants all the time. We do this with animals too, dogs and cats and rabbits and so forth too. And if you think about dogs, which we, we've touched on this topic already, companionship, hunting skills, sentinel behavior, are they able to be alert, guard dogs, their size, things like that. So what traits, so let's talk about like if we wanted to breed a herding dog, if we were raising sheep or something else, what makes a dog a good herder for sheep? Well, first off, they need to be able to circle around the flock of the sheep, so they gotta be fast, they gotta move around and do that. They need to force the sheep to stay together in a herd. Sheep tend to wanna stay together anyway, you know, this safety in numbers. And we also wanna be able to protect the flock. We don't want them, you know, the dog, the sheep don't need to be friendly with the dog, but they need to understand the dog is going to protect them. It's not a wolf trying to eat them, as that were. 
So if we look at this, in this case, you know, we have three different situations here. We have generation one, we have generation five here in the middle, and then we have generation N over here on the right. So um, here we have three different dogs that are herders. We have a very good herder that has put the sheep together and more or less in a herd. We have a good herder that's got most of the sheep in a, her in a her herd, but not entirely. And then down here at the bottom, we have the poor herder where the sheep are kind of doing what it is. And he, you know, he's a good boy. He's right. Well, not for this job, sadly, no. So what you're typically going to do is when you have several dogs that are like this, you're not going to keep breeding your poor herders. You're going to breed your very goods with your goods. And we can test the males and females and see which are better at doing this. And then preferentially, we breed these. We artificially select for those. If we had evidence that herding skills were heritable, then in the next generation, we would continue to sort the dogs. So now we have a very good herder and we have two good herders that come from that generation. This is five generations later from the original generation or four generations later from fifth generation. And eventually we'll get to a point where we have generation N and N just stands for number. So some generation after so many years of doing this where we have two that are excellent herders. Notice all of the sheep are flocked together and we still have maybe some very good herders. You know, you know, they, can't have, you know they have that one sheep that they kind of let stray over to the side, but eventually we get to the point where the population is mostly good herders. And this is where we start to see like our border collies, our collies and you know our other sheep herding dogs, you know, start to kind of, you know, look a little bit different as a result of this because we have bred them for that particular trait. In the late 1950s, a Russian geneticist, Dmitry Bailev, um, with Ludmilla Trutt and some others said, well, if we did this with wolves to dogs, can't we do this with foxes? And so they actually started their series of experiments in Siberia and bred a bunch of foxes in the hopes of trying to domesticate the fox. So what they would do is they would you know, have these foxes and they would take the tamest of the foxes. And granted, it's not tame, just tamest of what they had. And they were allowed to breed. And this would result in foxes that could be held and petted by humans and even seek out human contact. And I've heard that, and, and personally I'm fascinated by this because I've heard foxes bark like dogs and purr like cats. So it's like having the best of both worlds, kind of, maybe, in that respect. But this has led to some interesting experiments and some interesting results as a result of this. Um, so we end up with what's called domestication syndrome. So a lot of times people look at videos or pictures of dogs or cats, and when they do that, they kind of ooh and aww and all of that because they look cute. And they it's not just by happenstance that they look cute. There is apparently something biological that as we breed these animals to be more tame, their coloration changes, their ears get floppier, their tails get more curvy. They typically take on more juvenile characteristics. They don't look harsh and mean like a angry wolf. They look more like a puppy, if you would. And this happened with the foxes as well. Um, he hypothesized humans selected for tame behavior but that other features of domestic animals result as a change of being genetically tied to those genes. So he said whatever it was in those genes that made the foxes more tame apparently is also connected to features that make the animals seem, well, more juvenile, for lack of a better term there. Um, so this is an interesting study that kind of has gone on even today. So this is not so much about the study, but they do talk about domesticated foxes. And I'm going to stop here. This is from The Verge. So, uh, you know, it's not the greatest material in the world, but it, they talk about the domesticated foxes. Go look at some cute, cuddly foxes for a little bit. And we'll, I'll see you after the click.